Iowa. Well, our rating's been in the twos for so many years. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the Super Bowl. And I want to talk about I'm the Super Bowl with a guy who won three of them. It was vital to the Niners' success on that offensive line. Bob McKittrick, of course, the longtime offensive line coach. Bill Walsh, the coach. And he knows a little something about playing in big games. He's a college football Hall of Famer, former 49ers offensive lineman, and three-time Super Bowl champ. Randy Cross joins the Morning Rose here on the Boxer and Gersey guest line. Randy, good morning, man. Thanks so much for spending some time with uh, Joe Shasky and Bonte Hill. Uh, it's my it's my pleasure, guys, and it's uh, I'm happy for the Bay Area. I think all Niner fans are uh, they've got this coming. No, yeah, we, we we feel like it, man. This is a big game. We can't wait to get down to Vegas for this big game between the Niners and the Kansas City Chiefs and rematch the Super Bowl 54. And you know about rematches. Uh, obviously, you guys played the Bengals in 81 and then later on in 88. What was that like playing a team the second time around in the Super Bowl? Although there was a different cast of characters, maybe even different coaches, but same team, same organizations. Yeah, when it's, when it's seven years separated, especially in the NFL, um, it's the same two organizations, but as far as the teams, the, the teams were right. pretty different, you know. And, and there was there, were, I, I would say, less than fifteen guys, I think, from that first Super Bowl that were still there for the next one, if it was that high. But you know, the motivation I know for Bill was still there because it was a place that he had he had worked and right. he always enjoyed beating the make the Bengals. But, you know, especially the way that game went, you know, you look back at that, that Super Bowl, the last one here against Kansas City, um, it was right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're a, hey, we should have, could have, would have, you could have a field day watching that tape. If you had an opportunity to address Kyle Shanahan, knowing what we know about Shanahan, I know you've, you've watched it with a fine-tooth comb in Atlanta and then now mm-hmm. with the 49ers when he lost the Super Bowl, what would your suggestion be to him. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you know he doesn't know football. I'm just saying, like your your suggestion to him to do different in this Super Bowl that he didn't do in the last two. Hey, it's it's always incumbent upon a coach, especially a coach who calls plays. Um, you've got to constantly be evolving. You've got to constantly be changing. You've got to you've got to be a moving target for your opponents. But you know what? Sometimes it's it, it's okay to run the ball. Sometimes it's okay to run the same play twice if it works. Um, you know, that the loss against the Patriots for the Falcons when he was OC is something that I'm sure stung severely being in that situation and losing the way they did. And, you know, being in a position to win it in New Orleans, you know, where you, you could have run the ball, you could have done different things. He, he gets another shot. And I'm sure he'll insist, and hey, all that doesn't matter. But it, it's he'll be amazed by how much better being one and three in Super Bowls, or one and two in Super Bowls, is going to feel compared to uh, not having a win. Yeah, that would be tough for everybody here in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, Think about the fact that they've got the four NFC Championship games in the last five years. Two Super Bowls in the last five years. We're talking to Randy Cross here on the Boxer Girls and Guest Line. Three-time Super Bowl chat with the 49ers, former offensive lineman, center guard. You name it. He did it all on the offensive line, Randy. Obviously, part of that catch game. We all remember that. Joe and I were not even born yet when that play happened. We were born later that year, but we've watched the game over and over. The call by Vince Scully. In Montana, a lot of people forget he had three interceptions, threw three picks in that game, but was able to come back and make that dramatic play, that dramatic throw to Dwight Clark there in the back of the end zone. Watch a Brock Purdy come back twice. And it's been a little rewriting in both playoff games this year. What have, you seen, what have you seen from him? Has he conjured up memories from those days with Montana in the early years with the 49ers in the early 80s? The way he's finished the last two games, absolutely. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's no possible way. And despite, despite having that ability to close, and despite answering the bell when you really, really needed to, you're still going to have a good number of haters out there for whatever reason that are going to criticize and take pot shots at a guy, especially a young guy like this, that, you know, they, they just don't believe. I don't know if I can't think of anybody in that offense you'd want in that offense that would be better at it. That has a record now of a guy that can answer the call in the big moments. Uh, And it really makes you think, how much different that Philly game would have been last year. At least that's what I was thinking of after the championship game this year. I was like, man, if he doesn't hurt his elbow, 
you know, there isn't a, there isn't a safe lead against this guy. And mm-hmm. he could do that against, he could have done that against Philly. They could have been in another Super Bowl. But, you know, that's, that's woulda, coulda, shoulda territory. But, yeah, I mean, his ability to come back and answer the bell, that's the thing. What's your biggest criticism of a guy that may indeed be the MVP, Lamar Jackson? It's how does he answer late in big games? How is he in the most intense pressure moments? He had a chance a week and a half ago. And, again, it slipped away from him. Those are the kind of games and those are the kind of moments you build your legacy and your reputation on. And that is why I think a lot of people that know what they're talking about in the game think so highly of Purdy because he's answered the bell and he's made the other guy pay. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were talking about how prolific uh, McCaffrey season has been. Um, just in, in terms of Niner excellence, you know, I mean, Jerry Rice's 87 season, even though there was a strike and guys crossing the picket line and what I mean, he scored 23 touchdowns, 22 touchdowns in, in one, um, in one year and like 12 games. You played with Roger Craig. Games. What's that? Yeah. I said 12 games too. That was crazy. I know. Insane. <laughs> you know, it was, it was an incredible year. Yeah, he caught 65 balls that year, right? McCaffrey's had like 340 touches this year, 23 touchdowns, 2,000 yards, and that's just the regular season. You played with a guy, Roger Craig, who my my partner here thinks is one of the most underrated players yeah. in the history of the game. I can't believe he's not the Hall of Fame, Randy. I, I really can't. He was a decade in the 80s running back, uh, running back in the 80s yeah. with Walter Payton. Yeah. This is incredible. Anyway, go on. Join, join, join the club. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all agree. But, like, I'm looking at CMC, and no one's talking about him heading into this game. Game. And to me, yeah. he, I think he's the best player on the team. And I think he's one of the best players on the planet. He's got no holes in his game. Like, when you have a player of that magnitude, what does that do for a team? What does that do for an offensive line? It's it's a huge confidence builder. Um, they've got a really talented offensive line, led by one of the greater greatest tackles that's ever played the game. Um, so, they've got the ability to run. That's and, but it's the running game's lowbrow, guys. I mean, what kind of a genius needs to design a running game? <laughs> people, people discount the running game. It's like, eh, well. And I tell you what, the Niner defense better get their stuff together because Andy Reid's got a little something for you if you're going to defend the run like they did the last couple of games. And specifically, those defensive ends need to anchor those ends. They they got blocked on numerous occasions occasions by wide receivers and backup tight ends one on one. So yeah, it's the running game and, and what it does is something that and, and as this week goes on, you watch. We get into Friday or so and Saturday, there'll be more of an emphasis on that because about how important it's going to be in this game. And that's that's what makes you know CMC so valuable to the Niners is that exact same look he can give you in an inside or an outside zone run, they can give you the exact same look, and he's a receiver. Yep. And it's it's nasty. Yep, yep. Randy Cross here on a one of Ross, courtesy of the boxer and girls and guest line. You're still spot on. And last year, the Chiefs Super Bowl, the Chiefs Super Bowl win over the Eagles, Isaiah Pacheco was a difference maker, I believe. They stuck to the running game, and he had 75 hard your hard-earned uh, uh, yards there. He averaged over five yards a carry. How do the Niners fix this run defense in such a short period of time? It gets Andy Reid, who's a genius, and then you give him an extra week to prepare for you, and he's going to cook up all these things here. Is it scheme? Do, you, do they need to go to maybe a five-man front like they did against Jacksonville? What do they need to sw- fix on this defensive line and this defense to stop the run this Sunday? Part of it's, part of it's the scheme, and a good bit of it is – is discipline and determination. You know, the discipline of playing your role in an individual defense that the, that the coach calls, and that, that discipline is really important. But the determination of not staying blocked, not being beat, just just outplaying the guy in front of you, that's, that's, that's up to you. That's not, a, that's not a variable that is out of your control. And I think as that defense plays, and you'll get spread out, yeah, you're going to have to defend a good bit of the field because Andy Reid's not going to get in three tight ends and run the veer. Um, he's going to be coming at you from all kinds of different yep. goofy angles. But it, it's that first tackler, first guy that gets an opportunity to make a tackle, 
is the most important tackle, tackler at any time on defense. He's got to at least get a piece and wait for everybody else to rally to him. Uh, Randy, you were a part of the rise of the dynasty of this team. You know, when they they came from nothing. I mean, l- just perpetual losers, you know? And and mm-hmm. what, what the city was going through in the 70s to the great dynasty and, and one of the top franchises in sports. And they've returned. Even though they haven't won the Super Bowl, they've returned to that excellence. And the fan base... It's blowing me away. I watched the game with my little guy the other day um, of you guys in the great comeback against the Saints. There's like seven people in the stands. This is when my dad was a season ticket holder. He goes, you could basically sit anywhere you want. Now Niner fans are taking over on the road and going all over the place. I mean, are you blown away as someone who was there from the beginning when there was no one at the games? Are you blown away by just the fandom of the 49ers? Um, I enjoy the hell out of <clears throat> watching games when, when they're on the road and <laughs> half the three quarters of the stadiums were in red. <laughs> um, and that's pretty consistent. And that fan base has grown leaps and bounds. Um, I always referred to, you know, you, you talk about that game against the Saints. Yeah. And that, that same year in 80, our last game of the year, it was raining. And there were about, I don't know, 18, 20,000 people in Candlestick. I always refer to them as the faithful. You know, I say, you know, the faithful, it's, it's easy to be faithful when you're winning, right. when you're getting rings and all that. But when you're there day in, day out, bad teams, in the rain, bad, you know, and you count those heads, that's how many of people that were really true, just hardcore Niner fans. Mm-hmm. And now that number has grown exponentially by the thousands as far as multiples. It's nationally, they may have one of the bigger brands in all of sports, the hell of the NFL. Yeah, no, you're right, Ray D. I mean, you're spot on. We've, Shask and I have started to travel over the last few years, and it's spectacular to go down to L.A. and take over the Rams Stadium, SoFi, go into Jerry's World and take it over that stadium here. But I do want to ask you about getting ready for the Super Bowl, because mm. this week is mayhem. Obviously, all the media obligations, media opening night. I know it was a little different in the 80s, but what was it like that week of prepare for the Super Bowl? You land, you get your practice work done, and you fly out, whether it's Detroit, whether it's Miami, Miami, where you play, whether it's New Orleans. What is this week like for the players? Um, it, it can be something that you, you really got to have an opportunity to enjoy something of it. You know, at least a night or two during the week, go out and have dinner, maybe go to a club or something and relax and right. blow, off, blow off a little steam. But you've really got to, you know, reel it in as the week gets longer. You've done a lot of the hardcore work, physical work, last week. This week, it's much more the mental side of the fine-tuning the game plan and fine-tuning your game and, you know, maybe for the eighth, ninth, tenth time watching that game that you you think is important of your opponent and trying to get that one little key, that one little read, that knee is cocked a little bit differently when they do this, that type of thing. And that's what you're looking for. And I think that's what you have to kind of retreat into as this game gets closer is just, just looking for that one little edge, and you can always find it. You know, Kyle looked a little loose on Monday at the uh, at the media uh, night. It, he just seemed very comfortable and calm, and I feel like the players felt very loose because they they've been here before. Can you just retell us the story about Bill Walsh dressing up as a bellhop? <laughs> you know, cool. before the first yeah. one, keeping you guys loose because. I think his his comedy is underrated yeah. uh, in retrospect. We think of him as like so serious and f- so cerebral, yet he he really understood how to like get people to laugh in the moment. Yeah, yeah, he really did. And there's a lot of examples as far as jokes and stuff he'd say in team meetings and whatnot. But I just remember, and I was one of the first, you know, five or six guys off the bus. As I got off the bus, I was worried about busting my butt, you know, on the ice or something. So I'm looking <laughs> down at the ground as to what I'm stepping on. And all of a sudden, this this arm with this jacket of like a, you know, a bellhop reaches out and grabs my bag. And I've got my hand on it. And I yank it back. And he yanked it back the other way. And I look up and go to yank it really hard. And it was Bill. And he's smiling. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> I keep walking. And he's doing that messing with guys as they come out. And, that's that's just one of the ways he did it. I mean, he just, for instance, we, we both, a lot of stuff about practice venues this week, right? Yep, yeah. Yep. With uh, UNLV and uh-huh. the soft field and whatnot. We had to use the same field. We had to use, the, actually, the Silver Dome. Wow. And we lost the toss, so we had to practice early. 
So we're practicing early. Cincinnati is in the tunnel at the end of our practice. They can't wait to get out there. Their their chin straps are buckled. They're ready to go. They're just going crazy. We're out there. Bill's blasting music, all sorts of different music. We're playing air guitar in the background, just kind of having fun, goofing off as the defense runs their drills. And you look down to the other end, and those the Cincinnati players are just shaking their heads. And you know they're thinking, these goofballs, they have no shot. We're going to drill them. And it had a, a completely opposite effect on us because at no time in that game and in the whole process were we really uptight. What, what was more, you know, jarring in keeping the, the crew loose? Bill dressing up as a bellhop or Hacksaw urinating right on the field? <laughs> oh, gosh. We got kids in the car. <laughs> <laughs> That's a was, famous story. I know it is. I was, I was more amazed than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character, I mean, I, huh? Me personally, I was on the field when that happened. So you come out of the sideline and you just feel somebody you're getting a drink and you're sitting there and somebody is one of the backup guys goes, man, you wouldn't believe what, ch- what just happened here. <laughs> Say what? Hacksaw was peeing on the sideline. They hold up towels, and he's over there. I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I got to ask you, Randy. Uh, uh, going to the first Super Bowl, obviously, that's a lot of fun. But what was it like going to that Bengals Super Bowl in Miami? Ooh. And I don't know if you guys had any inkling that it would be Bill Walsh's final game as head coach of the 49ers. Did you have any clue that it would be his last game? And if you did, what was that week like, knowing that, damn, Bill, Bill might be stepping away? Yeah, you know, I, I had announced my retirement that Wednesday at the media day. Uh huh. And on the plane going to Miami, I went up to first class and I sat down next to Bill and I told him what I was going to do. And he's sitting there and he's drinking a nice little glass of white wine and he sits at it and he looks at me and goes, you know what, I think that's great timing. And if we win this game, there's no telling how much longer I'm going to be coaching. And he goes back to sipping his wine, I get up and I leave. And being the uh, astronaut-level genius that I am, I didn't take that hit, you know. Huh. So when he retired, you know, the Monday or Tuesday in Monterey after that and left the game, I was totally shocked until he actually announced it. Then I sat there and I went, you idiot. He told you that on the plane. <laughs> Dad, I, I forgot that. you retired after that game, Randy. No, that's right. That's right. You did retire after that game. What a game to retire from, man. Super Bowl, that Super Bowl was special, man. Montana to Taylor, and of course you guys win that one, 20 to 16. You win three championships, beat the Dolphins and the Bagels twice. Randy, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. Gonna be, we're a little nervous about Mahomes, I'm not going to lie to you. Mahomes scares us a little bit, but it feels like, man, this is the time. It's been a special season for this group. They've got high level, high IQ guys, good character on this team. It feels like it's time to break this drought, Randy. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think the Niners take this. And I think uh, you're going to see a lot of things in this game. It's going to be crazy. I mean, Kansas City loves to play a lot of man. Mm. And Spagnuolo likes the blitz. He likes to do it because he's got a really good defensive line. So that the line of scrimmage is always important in, in these yep. games. But I think it will be even more important, whether it's the Niner D-line performing against the run or the Niner O-line being able to pr- protect Brock Purdy for that extra half a second before it drills the ball down the field. Who, who's your X factor? I, I think CMC. Yeah. I, I think he's going to be the, the Swiss army knife, the, the multi, the multi tool, you know, and the guy that never gets talked about, uh, you know, or not talked about enough to me because there are so many stars is Ayuk yeah. and what a huge presence he is. But maybe my favorite guy on that, on that skill position, uh, that team full of skill guys, might be Jennings. Ooh, anybody anybody yeah. that can drop b- block somebody's ass all the way into the bench is my kind of guy. Yep. I love that. Joe Jennings is a tough guy. Let's go. You got the Niners winning, huh, Randy? Yes, I do. I think they come back. It's going to be a late fourth quarter. Either way, O or D score, but it's going to be a <laughs> Niners late. So we'll be stressing. I got goosebumps. We'll be stressing. I can't wait. Randy. Hey, Randy, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. We admire class. you, man. Uh, I had a poster of you. Uh, holding up Bill Walsh's Stafford Stadium after you guys blew out the Dolphins uh, back in the Super Bowl 84-85 season. So, Randy, uh, we'll talk to you whenever you can, man. we love to talk to you, man. Absolutely. It's always good catching up with you. You got it. Anytime you need me. Randy Cross here in the morning. We're also on 95.7 The Game, courtesy of the Boxer Girls and Guest Line, three-time Super Bowl champ. That's